Well, this is very special. This is our last conversation of the week, and it's part of an ongoing series of the Artist As. We've done Artist As Activist, Artist As Farmer, and many other, and this is Artist As Curator. I'm very proud to introduce Hans Ulrich Oberst of the Serpentine, and it's his idea of this conception, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for for being here, many thanks to, uh, to Mark Spiegler, to uh, Basel, Basel Miami, and of course to Mari and also to Jessica, and foremost to all the artists for agreeing to be on the panel this morning. Um, it's a very uh, wonderful situation that this evolutive ongoing panel uh, can develop over so many years. We've been doing it now um, as the artist has for almost actually five years and of course many of these topics um, uh, continue then to be explored. For example, the topic of the artist as a farmer led to many other incarnations. The topic we're addressing today is a topic which never goes away and it's a topic which has always uh, being present. Uh, so please give a very, very warm welcome to the protagonists of our panels today, to Joseph Kosus, to Massa Rosa, to Rike Tiravanisha, to Martha Wilson, and to Liu Ding. And it's a topic which uh, never goes away because it's very much in the center of uh, what exhibition making is, that actually many of the key exhibitions are often and have been curated by artists. And it's uh, fascinating to see if we look, for example, at uh, Bruce Altschuler's now two-volume history of exhibitions where he uh, visits what he considers to be the most important exhibitions of the 20th century, how many of these shows are actually either curated or co-curated by artists. And for me, being born in Zurich, uh, obviously there's always been you know, Dada and the Cabaret Voltaire, which, as Martha Wilson pointed out in a lecture recently, only lasted five months, but changed art history. Um, so Dada, but many of the surrealist exhibitions, if you think about Marcel Duchamp in uh, Paris and then in New York, he curated the surrealist show, uh, and that goes really throughout the 20th century. Many key exhibitions are curated by, um, by artists. Uh, it's not only exhibitions, it's also collections, if you think about Warhol's uh, raiding the Icebox, and we um, obviously going to address both the idea of exhibition curating and collection curating by artists. But it goes actually further back than the 20th century, and it's interesting that we can go back as far as Courbet, because uh, French painter Gustave Courbet was very frustrated by his lack of recognition from the Academy, which was the only way for an artist to earn credibility in 19th century France. The start favored by the Academy involved the use of large canvases for important subject matter, such as historic or also mythical scenes. Kobe did not abide by this hierarchy of values. His large-scale painting, Bur Burial at Ornans, had shocked audiences in 1851 by showing the humble residents of his hometown in a manner normally reserved for the social elite. So in 1855, Kobe submitted a similarly radical canvas, an allegorical portrait of himself entitled The Artist Studio. The Artist Studio was rejected by the Academy, and in response, Kobe decided to take matters into his own hands. He erected a temporary structure near the Salon and installed 44 of his paintings in it, calling his exhibition a pavillon of realism. Kobe's self-mounted exhibition inaugurated the modern period in painting in which the artist, rather than his patron or her patron, became the protagonist of art. Equally importantly, Kobe helped to free the public exhibitions from the sole authority of the state. Within 10 years, further revolts against the hegemony of the Academy occurred. Protests by artists led Napoleon III to mandate that rejected artists be allowed to show at the center uh, and actually at the other uh, of the official exhibition hall. This led then in 1863 to the Salon des Refusés, which showed the works of artists including Paul Cézanne, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Camille Pissarro, and also Edouard Manet, who had been refused from that year's official exhibition. The exhibition features some of the century's most celebrated works, including, of course, Manet's uh, Déjeuner sur l'herbe. So as you can see, there is really a very, very long history of this topic of the artist as a curator. And I'm extremely excited that we have um, five wonderful artists here present uh, on the panel today who will tell us about their experience with curating. We're gonna have these five presentations now, then a discussion among the participants, um, and hopefully a discussion with all of you. 
We will start with Joseph Kosuth, and um, actually Joseph and I had a conversation the other day in London at the Royal Academy where we discussed his curating um, of exhibition, of course also curating of collections, the uh, exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, something in his work actually curating from the very beginning of his work in the 60s. So please give again a very, very warm welcome to Joseph Kosuth. Let's turn it on. Good. Thank you all for coming on this ungodly hour on a Sunday morning. Um, this is just a, I have a piece of text from the larger uh, presentation, but the main points get covered. Um, if I don't lose my voice before we get there. And I also have a few images, um, which I think I'll do after. borrowed meanings, some brief comments on curated installations. I begin with a little quote from Gilles Deleuze. If one tries to play this game other than in thought, nothing happens. If one tries to produce a result other than a work of art, nothing is produced. The game is reserved then for thought and art. A present exhibition recently opened at the 21st House in Vienna Sigmund Freud and the play on the burden of representation is the most recent addition to a series of works that goes back to the beginning of my practice in one form or another for the past 40 plus years. It began in 1967 while still technically enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. I was avoiding the Vietnam War at the time. And 22 years old, I started an artist's run gallery on New York's Lower East Side, 12th Street and 2nd Avenue initially called the Lannis Gallery, but later changed to the Museum of Normal Art. I organized my first curated installation, and it was also my first one-person show in the gallery. The installation was called 15 People Present Their Favorite Book, and it included books contributed by Ed Reinhardt, Saul DeWitt, Robert Smithson, Joe Baer, Carl Andre, Christine Kozlov, and some nine other artists, as well as myself. But it was two installations of mine done in the early 1990s, the play of the unsayable at the Vienna Secession and the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels for the Wittgenstein Centennial, and the play of the unmentionable for the Brooklyn Museum in New York were the first large institutional versions of my curated installations, and they were done, among other objectives, with the intention of rupturing the status quo of how exhibitions are made and doing that by raising questions about the habituated, institutionalized approach to the construction of an exhibition. It is important to note that I am not an art historian, nor am I a curator. I'm an artist, and we need to consider here what such a difference means. Since the beginning of my practice as an artist, I've made it clear that it is my belief that the primary material of an artist is meaning, if only its cancellation. And thus, in my work, linguistic relations between objects and images and language itself has had a primary role. Forms and colors, for example, are to my mind a used up approach to art making, even though they may continue to be present and used for other purposes and having other meanings than they have had traditionally. A consequence of this understanding and approach has often meant that the material of the work has been the context itself. At the time the Vienna Secession asked me to do the Wittgenstein exhibition for them and the city of Vienna, as it was the only centennial exhibition being planned, they pointed out that the Secession is perhaps the only museum in the world run with a board comprised of artists. For this reason, it was their feeling that it would be most appropriate if the Wittgenstein centennial exhibition would be organized not by an art historian or a philosopher, but by an artist. It was with this perspective that I felt important questions could be asked about both exhibitions and art if an exhibition would, its, would be a work of art itself. My appropriation of the exhibition format as a basis for my work clearly does, does change the experience of when it is a work of art itself. The most relevant question about art recovered from modernism and which comprises much of the postmodern practice remains ontological ones. If the exhibition you are seeing is a work itself comprised of other works, what is the difference? An important difference is that the artist, due to the nature of the activity, takes subjective responsibility for the surplus meaning 
that the show itself adds to the work presented in it. A major aspect traditionally of the art historian's practice involves objectifying what is essentially a subjective activity. And this is done by masking it with the authority of science, which our university system traditionally anoints art historians with, given that the exact sciences are the models used and the basis and bias of university knowledge. While it is certain that scholarship and connoisseurship plays an important role in the assessment of historical work of previous centuries, but when we approach contemporary art, our priority should be more an informed understanding of the artist's intentions with that interface with the work's reception by the viewer. Instead, with art historical practice, we have instead the imposition of judgment and objectivity. The effect of such an authoritative voice on our understanding and appreciation of a contemporary work of art is not a productive nor positive one in most cases. What is left out and experientially transformed by the perceived need to construct a cultural audubon of masterpieces, as important as that is for the validation in the art market, it clearly has as its mission the glorification of a particular cultural his history and thus a particular social order. The experience of the public of surplus meaning taking this form is clearly most often simply authority itself, with the result being naturalized and viewers depoliticized as they are distanced from the meaning-making pro process. What is denied is their own cultural political moment, something no longer available at that moment in the cultural act of looking and thinking. My intentions in forming a curated installation for the Victor Stern Centennial was not to promote an historical view nor engage myself with the crafting of history. Indeed, my goal was the contrary. I invited, I invited the viewer to participate with me in the reading and experience of the play, of the meaning my juxtapositions produced. Importantly, I did not mask the event of my juxtaposition or my authorship in doing it nor did I make claims of validity, value, or importance pertaining to the integrity of the individual works used in my installation. The point is that in viewing the relations between works provided by a context of meaning constructed by an artist, the viewer, in effect, has an invitation to participate in the meaning-making process, and by doing so also participates in a discourse permitting them to experience the process of making art itself. Keep in mind that rather than eclipsing the integrity of works by the individual artists, I was told by many viewers of both the Wittgenstein and the Brooklyn installations shows that experiencing works put in play as I did in my curated installations articulated difference in a way which made the individual works as works by specific individuals more visible rather than less and articulated the terms upon which each individual work was made for each artist. Such work then, released from being signposts of, signposts of authority, are seen as a result of an artist's thinking, that is, as a process, and therefore more accessible. I feel these installations provide the viewer with a sense of how art is made and how, indeed, artists think. In Vienna, that surplus meaning, which is my work, is the choice of works and their form of presentation, all that which goes into that installation, which includes both the zero and not wallpaper walls, as well as the juxtaposed works by other artists. And is not unlike a writer's claim of authorship to a paragraph, comprised as it always is, as a new use of old words invented by others. So now some photos so you understand what I'm referring to, hopefully. Kind of, kind of small, isn't it? Yeah, we can see it there. All right. This is this is. Oh, it's okay. This is one of the books. This is Ed Reinhardt. Ed Reinhardt in, uh, in, came to my studio a couple of times, and once he came, he saw these dictionaries with holes in the pages where I had stolen the definitions, and he laughed. He said, "I got a book like that in my studio," and it was he used uh, this book for most of his cartoons, and he cut the pages out and and reapplied the images.
In the history of all these shows, there was only one artist who insisted that their work was removed, and that was Carl Andre, who said, if, it's about, if you're doing it, it's conceptual art, and I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> Good old Carl. <laughs> there were there's more going on than these photos of course let you in on. There was some relation between the tractatus and the investigations, blah blah blah. But anyway. Time and context doesn't permit much more. This, this, this show then traveled to um, Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels, which was about two and a half times larger space. I found out what museums go through borrowing. If you don't have a collection, it's very difficult to borrow a work from a museum that does have one, because they know you'll never loan them anything. So I had to call up people and twist arms. But I've done that before. It's in, it's in French and, and uh, Flemish because it was in Bel uh, Brussels. Normally, the um, Brooklyn Museum did these exhibitions of contemporary art where you would bring in a sculpture and plunk it in the lobby. And I said, can I do anything I want? And they said, sure. So I went into the collection and pulled out things showing that history is very much the texture, the problematicity of cultural activity. And a lot of this stuff was um, um, very much... This show and the show in Cincinnati are credited with getting the Republicans, they realized that in fact it was impossible to enforce some of the recent laws they had put through. When they, this is the time they went after the NEA for showing naughty, supporting naughty activities done by artists. So this is the current show, it just opened, um, when was it, last month? No, September. And um, I worked with the work of 70 artists. It was done, uh, the Sigmund Freud Museum uh, and um, the Belvedere's 21st House invited me to do it. I did the 50th at the Freud Museum uh, because I spent the 80s working with Freud in my work. And um, so this was the 75th.
I don't know whether anybody put together Francesca Woodman and Cindy Sherman, but I thought it was really, uh, the room works really great, the two of their works. And you worked on, uh, on Freud, of course, because there was the earlier Freud yeah. Museum, so it's an ongoing... Well, no, it was, it, was, it was just the 80s. Yeah. That's how I spent them. And I worked with Freud, except for this one. Yeah. This is Mike Kelly. Um, I wanted to work with his work in a way that it wasn't normally presented, so it was just a simple room with these two very close but quite different works. These are some of the works I did in the 80s, um, which they wanted to have a room of. Oh, these are the uh, different zero knots. You may have known one. It was a Lille Castelli Gallery on Green Street, which was reproduced a lot. And this was a slideshow of the different... I did 14 different cities. I did uh, that work. And this is the collection. I, I ran a... I run a foundation at Sigmund Freud Museum in which I invite artists to contribute works related to Freud. And uh, these are some of the works. This is Franz Vest's bed, for example, and Heim Steinbach's um, Aha. The shoe of Sherry Ch Levine. Elie Kabakov. And then these are works of mine from the 80s, of, uh, from the Freud work. That's it. Thank you. Joseph, thank you so very, very much, and many, many questions to then explore in the later conversation. Uh, I remember in 89, I was a student and went to Vienna, um, uh, actually for a week, visiting your show there every day, and it was very much what Deleuze Guattari said about Mille Plateau. There was not a way to read that Wittgenstein book. One could see it every day uh, differently. And, you know, 89, we had last year the panel here, we see Mark Gaste on 89+, plus, and that sort of whole idea of 89 being the year where Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet, it being the year, he called it Inquire at the beginning, which is interesting uh, in terms of inquiry. It's also the year where the GPS was invented. It's the year of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's the year also of the invention of GPS. And very importantly, it's also the year of if you lived here. And that leads us to uh, our next uh, speaker, to Martha Rosler. Um, there are, of course, many, many projects Martha has uh, curated, uh, particularly important uh, if you lived here. It's a project of three exhibitions uh, for meetings. This project was a great inspiration for Molly Nesbitt, Rike Tiravanija, and me when we did Utopia Station and conceived of it, you know, not as an exhibition, uh, as a kind of a one-off, but as something which evolves through chapters and where the meetings and the gatherings are as an important part, where the discursive part is as an important part as the actual um, manifestation. And Yvonne Reiner once said, uh, actually, uh, that this project of Martha showed us how an art exhibition can constitute radically different uh, approaches, that actually an art exhibition does not have to separate or isolate its objects from the conditions uh, under which those objects have been produced. A very, very warm welcome to Martha Rosner. It's on? Okay. Um, thanks for coming. It's sort of the middle of the night for me and it's sort of panic stricken. Is this? Give it a try. It's just the green one. Oh. Okay. Um, I was, um, I'm not a curator. I don't actually think that uh, most things that people call curating are curating. I'm certainly uh, interested in being an organizer of various things, including exhibitions, but. Um, I didn't uh, say one day I'm going to do, you know, I'm an organized stuff. Um, I was invited by Dia to have uh, 
an exhibition in conjunction uh, with their um, sort of sticking their toe into the water of uh, the real world uh, from being the high modernist uh, white man um, uh, boutique uh, place that they were, which was lovely, but um, a little bit nerve-wracking, especially since they had a really terrific series of discussions um, which were popular in the art world at that time to have public meetings with artists and so on, um, uh, called Conversations in Contemporary Culture or something like that. So um, when I was invited to do a show, uh, it was kind of the model they had me follow was um, uh, ba that they thought I would follow. It was based on something that I did in Colorado, which was a very large exhibition called Fascination with the Game of the Historical Hollow Leg, which was about um, war, uh, nuclear war in particular in Colorado, um, NORAD, uh, Cheyenne Mountain, where we had our bombers constantly. If, if you've seen the movie War Games, you know that uh, the war room. So uh, I proposed the show on homelessness, which was a word that suddenly appeared at that time. This was 1988, I guess. And it was the onset of the neoliberal effort to recapture cities um, for propertied elites and therefore the mass eviction of people in cities around the world. But I realized that um, in doing research that among other things, lots of artists in different cities, but not in New York primarily, were doing work about homelessness. And I also realized something else which is that, God bless us, it's very liberal to have a show done by the us's about the thems. So I thought, well, first of all, I don't have to be the author of all the works as I was in the Fascination Project, and I um, can follow the group material model and kind of expand to something else, invite other people, but I thought, um, doesn't only have to be artists, so I had filmmakers, video makers, poets, uh, architects, activists, advocates, and uh, kids, teachers, singers, choirs, uh, and um, homeless people it seemed so obvious. Um, so I worked with this group, the Mad Housers, who kind of still exist, which is a self uh, organized group of, uh, I guess, young architects and postgraduate designers working mostly in Atlanta to put together huts for homeless people, but as a way of getting them involved in um, first housing, but also social services. And uh, with this group called Homeward Bound, that's what they call themselves, they did a 100 plus day vigil in City Hall Park um, the preceding summer, and I, had quite a number of meetings with them and we kind of decided on the course of some of the uh, events. The Mad Housers came up and they built some huts. Uh, when the media discovered this, we certainly didn't say this is in conjunction with an art show because that was really irrelevant. So, these are, so I decided that part of the problem of what I was calling the liberal approach was to have a show on homelessness. Homelessness is a condition, but it's not, uh, I mean, it denotes a condition, but really we're talking about a process here. So I thought, okay, so there should be work about contested housing and people's fight to save their housing. And um, then I thought, but what about architecture and urban planning? Because this is part of the same. I mean, this all seems very obvious now, but I think in 1988 and 89, it was a little hard to work one's way through to these thoughts. I'm just protecting myself by saying that. So I thought then, okay, so we'll have an evolving institute, uh, organ <laughs> exhibition, sorry. And then I thought that's not gonna work because people will go, they'll see it and say, I saw it and they won't see, you know, why, why would I think people would return? So we divided it into three shows, home front, homeless, and city visions and revisions, and they were um, 
organized according to the thematic material involved. Um, and I'm, and there, in each one there was a reading room, which I kind of had done in the previous show as well and in many of the works, the fascination, many of the works I actually have put together include, you know, books and so on. A little note, I love Dia, but they took this photo, see that couch, see that rug, see that coffee table? There was a TV set there. When the photographer came, he removed the TV, and I said, well, the TV, that's a TV installation. And he said, yes, but TVs are ugly. So that's 1989. This is the interior of the reading room, and uh, these are just some of the artists, some of the photos, some of the installations, and I apologize for not giving them their due, and I see they seem to be slightly cut off. That, that was, um, that's Homeward Bound. They call themselves Homeward Bound Community Services because they actually wanted to offer community services both within and outside the homeless uh, uh, population, and they wanted an office in the gallery, so they're in their office in the gallery, and some of those people are not members, but friends, because it was a, a friendly group. This is a meeting held in, we built a shelter in, in the homeless organization. This is one of the huts, and I'm just, each of the three shows had a motto. I hope the gods of exhibition um, forgive me for just rushing through these, but I'm a, I'm a maximalist, and I don't know how to edit myself. There were 50 participants, uh, including groups. <clears throat> And a book ensued, which has been in print ever since. That was 1989. That, to me, is a miracle. And other versions have appeared in other places, all of which had some component that was local because it wouldn't do it otherwise. And then the archive circulated under the auspices of Eflux. Um, and there were also local events. This is Utrecht, Casco, and La Verena. Uh, and, um, okay, the next. I have more time, right? Yeah. Two minutes? No. Okay. You know, it's good that you talk about this idea of you curating a show within the show, no? as we discussed yesterday. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, one of my curators for Utopia Station at the Venice Biennale is Hans Ulrich Obrist. The other is Rick Ritt oh, on each side, um, my bodyguards, and Rick Ritter of Venetia, and uh, Molly Nesbitt, an art historian, is not here. So, we had an Ech curator, an artist, and an art historian. Um, but I was uh, living in Stockholm at the time, and um, if you've ever lived or worked, in and around the communities of artists in school in Scandinavia. They are all considered bona fide artists already. Um, and uh, so I was teaching at the Kunstfach in um, Stockholm and also flying to Copenhagen and teaching in the Royal Academy and flying home once a month to teach in the graduate program at Yale. And I thought, well, why not invite them all? And we'll think together for the eight months that we had and we'll put together something. And um, I also had worked here in Florida at New Smyrna Beach at the Atlantic Center in January of 2002 with an, a group of young artists who I'm still in contact with uh, called The Fleas. We have an online group now and I invited them as well. That's the lower right-hand corner. Um, so, and we had many models to consider. One of them was the Futuro, and you can see some of our books, and uh, 
I don't have time to explain this. Uh, part of the project was postering, so we made a number of posters with our participants, and that was the Scandinavian one, the previous one. This is the uh, Fleas, uh, um, the online group, and this was sort of a group. group. This was our flag. Oleana, if anybody knows, was a failed Norwegian colony in Pennsylvania, organized by a violinist named Ola Bull. Uh, and if you know the Pete Seeger song, you understand little roasted piggies there rush about the city streets inquiring so politely if a slice of ham you'd like to eat. So it's about failed projects. Um, and um, this was my banner, the Trojan horse on the uh, 35th anniversary of the Pavilion of Revolt uh, by the Scandinavian Situationists, a revolt that I think lasted like an hour, but important. So that's Molly. So we built our building. Um, did I say we built a building? That was the spaceship station, a site of hospitality. It came down, we built it in. Copenhagen, it came down on a boat. We picked it up and carried it. We lifted it like in a barn raising. Uh, then they relented and allowed us to have lifts, which we were told we couldn't have. And then we, so we made this unfinished building, which was the aim was to have an unfinished building because, you know, nothing succeeds like failure. Those are the participants on the left hand side. There's our flag. Um, and we had seminar cloths with uh, slogans like gross national happiness, which comes from Bhutan. Um, and uh, we did a newspaper with several issues. That's the mobile office on the right. Follow Oleana was our meetings for the newspaper. We did snicker gladia um, cutouts for the building. And this is our building. We also, this is the Fleas banner in the beautiful future, in our beautiful future with the Pache flag. Uh, this is the interior. We had lots of hosted projects other than our own. The circles represent the Futuro. And this is our group with, somewhere in there is Rikrit, out on the outside, I think, okay. Um, the next is 2011, proposed Helsinki Garden for at the Singapore Biennale in 2011. It was a very cold February. I was sitting in Grumpy Cafe with the snow heaped up, emailing two women I didn't know in Singapore, where it was, of course, 85 degrees Fahrenheit and very humid, and organizing, um, would you like to be in an exhibition on a uh, to do a community garden at the old airport in Singapore. And um, this was the Helsinki Garden. As we know, it's a different climate entirely. Of course, this was my metaphor for the idea of the traveling exhibition, uh, the ship of art. Um, and uh, I'm just, it was very hard to capture the project, but we had many, many meetings with uh, uh, the first, one of the first women I contacted said, only women? I said, well, uh, why, you want to work with men? She said, yeah. I said, sure. So uh, what's the problem? So, and I have to say, I don't have time to say it clearly enough. It turned out in this fantastically neoliberal place, all labor is done by completely unprotected workers from other countries in Asia. Uh, and that's the guy in the prince's yellow shirt. And um, everyone was very friendly and helpful, but um, all the work, sorry. These are some of the participants. The, the one on the right is migrant workers, housemates who are actually given a day off, which many are not, migrant ecologies. The point is that Singapore considers itself as a garden, and Lee Kuan Yew, the man who invented Singapore, is called the master gardener, so everyone understood that there was a political dimension which they could interpret it well in this work uh, with many different facets, which I 
can't go into. And as I said, it's actually was sort of unpicturable. These are the participants. That's a map of Singapore down there. Whoops, I think I showed that. And the last, and I hope you'll forgive me if I'm going too long, is a project in Warsaw, Poland, um, called How to Succeed in the New Poland, which was a series of public meetings on, as it says, gender, housing, labor, debt, artists, environment, and industry, which we actually was called by the participants How to Succeed Through Coal. Uh, immigration, which is in migration and out migration, what should we put in the new Jewish museum, which was a very fraught issue, gigantic building, um, the core exhibition organized by Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, but the place sort of like, uh huh, okay. And uh, should there be a Polish colony on Mars or its national identity? And in fact, it turns out that. Poland considered in the early part of the 20th century, you may know that some of the great anthropologists like Branis Malinowski were Polish, obviously, but they considered setting up a colony in Madagascar, so it's not, I mean, I didn't know that at the time. And so it, these were public meetings where people had little big pads and things to write on, and then there were discussions of the points that people made. That's how to succeed through coal. And that's it. Martha, thank you so much. Martha, thank you so very, very much. And actually, um, many links here from Martha and from Joseph to our next speaker, to Ricky Tirabanisha, of course. Looking at Martha's garden it made me think of the land and Rickrit's curatorial endeavor of the land, which in a similar way grows um, over time. And uh, then actually the projects we've been looking at, Martha's if you lived here and uh, many of Joseph's also earlier show, like the secession show happened at that time. Rickrit was working for Joseph Kossuth in the 80s uh, in, um, in New York. Rickrit has... <laughs> and Rickrit has many experiences, of course, that I mentioned as a, as a curator. The land uh, has mentioned one thing, a very long-term project. He also curated um, an exhibition of Fluxus, uh, and that connects actually to something which happened two days ago, when all of a sudden, by chance, here in the auditorium of the uh, Basel Miami conversation, I ran into Alison Knowles, and she encouraged us, and I think that's a kind of a very interesting question for the panel today, to use local ingredients when we do uh, exhibitions. Uh, Rickrit also, as an artist, is curating solo shows of artist colleagues, which is interesting. So more recently, he has curated a show by, by Superflex. A very, very warm welcome to Rickrit Tirabanija. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's amazing to be sitting on Sunday morning with your heroes around you. And so I'm very grateful to be here on this panel. Um, I was told this was going to be a kind of free-flowing conversation, so I didn't bring any slides. So we'll just free-flow from here. Um, I guess the thing about, uh, and, and just what you saw with Joseph and Martha, and you'll see with Martha, I mean, I kind of grew up looking at what they've been doing. And uh, I guess as a young artist, I certainly try to, you know, learn a lot from both their success and their mistakes, right? Um, and, and I guess I was very interested in Flux's art also earlier on as a young artist because I was always very uh, interested in trying to break, break down the barrier between the work and, you know, the people in a way. And um, so one of the earlier situations that I was involved with in uh, not so much curating, but I was kind of invited by the curators to install the exhibition. And, and in, in that request, I kind of like made a, a score, which was to defer the whole exhibition installation to the audience. So as people arrived to the exhibition, they were given a little basket, which was, had a little type written things on it, which says, you know, walk around the room five times and go home, or 
take a white glove and pick a, a piece of art and install it. And uh, so, and this was done in a space called Hall Walls up in Buffalo, which was, uh, I guess, one of these outposts artist-run spaces, which was quite important uh, at that time, and I'm not sure how they're doing now, but... So, so this was kind of like one of the early, kind of my early involvement with this idea of, um, in a way, curating or being part of curating situation. Yeah, went, to, yeah. And, um, and of course the audience participated, they, they, they got to handle very expensive cheap art, at, you know, which was a kind of contradiction for, for what we would think of as, as, as the idea of fluxes, which was something that was important for me to, to try to play out. Um, and of course there were other things that you, know, you could really handle and, and abuse and use. And so it was a kind of early relationship to the idea of trying to get, in a way, the, the audience you know, to, to be uh, very participatory with the work of art itself. Now I, I started, uh, I, I went to art school in Canada and Canada in the early 80s there wasn't a lot of um, in a way you know commercial structure to support the art and so a lot of the artists themselves had to self-organize and um, make their own spaces. So when I went to school in Toronto, there were spaces called YYZ and um, Mercer Union and, and, and some other spaces like that, which was quite important and influenced me a lot because, you know, this was a space, these were spaces that you could, you know, see exhibitions, but you also got to have dialogues, real dialogues with the artists themselves who were in the exhibition. And this has always been something that I think had a great deal of influence on me. And, um, and of course when I went down to New York, there were spaces like Franklin Furness where Martha Wilson will probably talk about. <laughs> and uh, artist space and um, you know, white columns. Uh, collective for living cinema. So these were all like spaces ran by artists and people who were making art themselves. And I, I kind of was, I guess maybe, you know, embedded into you know back of my head about the fact that as artists we have to kind of take care of ourselves, and we have to take care of what we have to say, um, and probably better that we say it them ourselves than to have someone else speak for us in that sense. So, you know, and, and in, in that relationship, I think, to, to be an artist who curate, for me, it's, it's kind of like part of the same activity as, you know, it's, I don't separate the two ideas, right? And I, I don't actually think about it as curating. So maybe when we look at how Joseph installs his exhibition, I mean, it's always about playing with that situation or questioning that situation or or you know to to question the institution of the structure itself, right? And um, so so I think those have always been important to me. And then, say perhaps like ten years ago, I, I after having worked a lot and been fairly well established, I returned back to Thailand and going home and realized that when I went back to Thailand that. Um, I wasn't so much interested in, in making exhibitions for people to look at because I didn't find that the work I was doing or what I thought what I was doing in the West was so relevant to, let's say, the possibility of who was going to look at the work or the audience there. So I just started to get, in, get myself, got myself involved with um, some local artists and young artists and I realized that again, kind of very similar to, you know, Canada in the 80s, and you know, in in, in Thailand even at the present, there is no real established um, kind of institution or structures that would support artists. So I decided to work with younger artists to kind of make our own space, and and we actually started off uh, making our own magazine. And in, in this relationship, I would say 
I'm more of a facilitator <laughs> than a curator, um, or I'm you know I'm the guy who cleans the platform and support the platform that other people can work on, and and in that relationship, I think it's it's kind of a open-ended curation. It's never been kind of um, too determined, but it was more about the will of the people who would participate in that sense. Um, recently, I was asked by a group of artists, and, 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 and this group of artists, I think, called Superflex in, in Copenhagen, have worked a lot with this idea of uh, uh, self-organized and the idea of self-determination and the idea of like rights and, 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 and in a way the process of what becomes privilege and what, what isn't. And, and I think um, I've worked with them and they've come to Thailand and have, have, have a very close relationship. So we're always in discussion. And I guess when they asked me to curate a part of their retrospective, I decided to curate all the works that had been rejected. So it was a kind of like everything that had been either rejected by the institution or had been uh, re requests or, or, you know, basically lawyers came and said to them, you can't make copies of Lacoste. You have to, uh, you know, you have to destroy them. So I decided to make a kind of a retrospective of all these things that were basically removed, and which then was just left with shadows. So, so you had a big space of just the shadows of the, the, the idea of the work. And, um, and, and, and they had made a project for the British Museum, which was a guided tour um, of the museum through the perspective of a of a cockroach, uh, you know, and um, and it was very very successful in the British Museum Science Museum. So I asked them that they would uh, introduce this uh, perspective with the cockroach uh, as a guided tour through their negative works or the work that had been removed. So so. The audience would come, they would get dressed up as a cockroach, and they would be taken through the exhibition through the eyes of a cockroach. Right. So those, those are kinds of things that I've been working with. Um, and I, I think I'll just kind of leave it for now, and we can, yes. Uh, just a subtext to what you said. The exhibition that um, Rick installed was called Flux Attitudes. And uh, Susan Hapgood and Cornelia Lauf were the curators. And I happened to be married to Cornelia Lauf at the time. So I was hearing, you know, backstories. But one of the interesting things was they wanted to be true to Fluxus, right? And they mixed, like Mike Kelly with flu old Fluxus and new Fluxus and stuff. Um, what happened, though, was that they were going to be true to the original ideas of Fluxus. It's kind of valuelessness and it's openness. Well, all those artists having, you know, were still in a state of shock by what happened to Joseph Boys. Cornelia got her PhD at Columbia on Boys, by the way, so that's part of how this came about. Um, they were furious that she was undervaluing their works. They wanted their little plastic throwaway things to be worth a lot of money, like Boys' things, you know. So um, they were, like, um, really under a tremendous pressure to uh, not be, shall we say, uh, true to the original ideas of Fluxus. I'm sure I'll get in trouble for telling this story, but what the hell. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Many thanks to Rick Reed. Thank you, Joseph. Now, there's many things, of course, we can pick up also later. It's, I thought it was very fascinating, the idea also of the, the solo show or the monographic show. Now, what you said about, about Superflex, because if you look at, for example, besides Bruce Altschul, another recent anthology on exhibition history is Jens Hoffmann's books of, you know, memorable exhibitions of the last 20 years, which he just did. And there there is a whole chapter on the artists as curators as artists. And, you know, categories include, of course, artists uh, curating collections from... Um, involving Warhol's Raiding the Icebox uh, or Joseph's uh, Brooklyn exhibition. It involves self-organized shows um, in a way 
uh, like the freeze show of Damien Hurst in 88, where a sort of whole generation gets visible, a sort of a peer group curating, one could say. It involves then more thematic shows. Now, if you think about Mike Kelly and the legendary Uncanny show. But what is interesting is that his idea actually of artists curating solo shows or monographic shows of their peers doesn't seem to appear a lot in exhibition history. And once that would start, it could lead to an incredible series of exhibition, which can only make us dream. But Rick Reed mentioned as a very important aspect of the discussion today, the idea of artist-run spaces. So this idea not only of a, you know, exhibition limited in lifespan at a very long-term project where an artist you know, runs a space, invents a space, um, and that leads us, of course, right away to our next speaker, to Martha Wilson, who as an artist founded and, di and directs the Franklin Furness Archive. Um, a very, very warm welcome to Martha Wilson. I am here today because Lucy R. Lepard curated me into an exhibition, which I happen to have in this book. It's, um, the backstory is that I was actually on the faculty of the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design because I was teaching English to art students who did not wish to read. Lucy came to town and saw what I was doing and she said, yes, this is art. And yes, there are women all over the world who are doing similar kinds of art. And she put me in a show, circa 7500, an exhibition organized by Lucy R. Lepard. It started at the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, California, and the, the number 7500 refers to the population of Valencia, California. Participating artists, uh, let's see. Jackie Apple, Alice Aycock, Jennifer Bartlett, Agnes Dennis, Nancy Holt, Poppy Johnson, Nancy Kitchell, Pat Lash, Rita Myers, Adrian Piper. It was organized as postcards, four by six postcards. This is her curatorial statement. Thank you so much. Each artist then got one of the cards the front and back of which could be used as art space. So here we see the page as art space, a very important concept to the institution I was going to form in New York just a few years later. Um, so I used, I used my card to do a piece called Breast Forms Permutated. This is a joke about the work of Saul LeWitt the, the uh, conceptual artists of the day were all coming to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and one of the overpowering uh, ideas of the time was to permutate an idea. So um, in this case, I'm permutating something that is limitless and has no end. The, the flat-chested example is in the upper left-hand corner, full-breasted, conical, pendulous, and the perfect set is in the middle. Um, I thought it was performance art. I thought what I was doing was performance art. And it, it ended up looking like text and image. See if I can find one of them. It ended up looking like text and image, and it remains so. Although, when I moved to New York, oh no, so, so part of the story is that my beautiful artist boyfriend, who looked like Marcel Duchamp, dumped my ass, and I thought, well, if I'm gonna put myself back together, I'm gonna move to New York the reputation of the feminist community outside of New York was that these women were mean ass girls who would rip you apart. And when I got to New York, I found out I made the best friends I've ever made in my life. There, there was nothing but an effort going on to create community. There were consciousness raising 
sessions, we were talking to each other, we would allow each other to talk and not shut each other up. It was a, a, a moment when the definitions of feminism and what the heck is feminism were being formed. Uh, and at the same time, the information show had occurred. Kiniston McShine did a very important show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1970. It was the information show, works of art that were text-driven, concept-driven. Uh, I moved to New York. I'm doing these little publications. I took them uptown to the Museum of Modern Art bookstore and said, well, we, will you sell my publications? The manager of the store said, look, lady, your publication costs $5, but it's going to cost us $5 to do the bookkeeping. So the answer is no, we're not going to sell your artist book. Artists were also doing street works. They were doing stuff on street corners, or they were doing temporary installation works. Uh, Barbara Kruger would put uh, up a giant ass poster on the wall overnight. And the uptown community was not really paying attention to what the downtown art scene was doing. There were some uh, uh, examples of efforts. Um, there was a projects room at the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, there were some efforts being made <clears throat> but basically, the uptown scene was ignoring what was going on downtown. I was in a building on Franklin Street that had been located by Willoughby Sharp, publisher of Avalanche magazine. Um, it had bookcases in it because it had been a ship chandlery. So, I walked into this place and saw that it could be a bookstore. But I knew I didn't want to get in bed with Willoughby Sharp, so, <clears throat> so I incorporated separately. And uh, however, Willoughby, when I told Willoughby Sharp that I was going to call it the Franklin Stove, he said, no, no, you must call it Franklin Furnace. He was absolutely correct. That's, that's how Franklin Furnace got its name. A museum for hot air. Really, what are we doing? We're creating ideas. We're creating discourse by making these weird works. We're creating an opportunity for ideas to be exchanged. So Franklin Furnace opened its doors April 3rd, 1976. Artist books on trestle tables. Uh, no particular attention made to uh, making these artist books into precious objects, quite the opposite. We wanted people to handle them and read them and look at them. Uh, printed matter was forming around the same time. We had a meeting and decided that Franklin Furnace would take the not-for-profit side of exhibition and archiving, and printed matter would take the for-profit side of publishing of artist books and distribution. Uh, printed matter was first in the Fine Arts Building, this direction in Tribeca, and then they went to Lisbonard Street, that direction in Tribeca. It was, you know, the community was talking to itself, let's be honest. The, the, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, a few years later, wanted us to reach a wider audience and started giving us grants to reach out to wider publics. which leads us to the discussion of the culture wars, which I'll just very briefly discuss. I mean, I'm, I probably don't need to tell you that politics is performance art, and it's been going on in this country for a long time. Uh, during the 80s, artists who used sexuality as a legitimate subject of art were targeted by the religious right as the virus eating away at the health of the body politic. Performance artists especially should be exterminated, and indeed the 
the fellowship program of the National Endowment for the Arts was killed off at the end of a 10-year lawsuit uh, between the NEA4, Karen Finley, Holly Hughes, John Fleck, Tim Miller, and the National Endowment for the Arts uh, lost its fellowship program. Um, I, I think that they really wanted they really wanted performance artists to just go away. But now I'm, now I'm gonna go back to the early days, very briefly, to say Franklin Furness did have a curator. Uh, through Lucy Lepard's catalog, I met Jackie Apple. Jackie Apple was Franklin Furness's curator in uh, 1976, 77, 78, 79. Then she moved to Los Angeles and the question of how we were going to select artists to present to the public came up for discussion. I really didn't want my personal taste to dictate what we were showing, so I convened a peer review panel and we started to have annual meetings at which we would duke out who are the artists we're gonna show next year we do this today. We have peer review panel meetings and we look at proposals from all over the world and we give, oh no, that, that I have to talk about going virtual, but we, we give money to crazy artists and, and we do it by peer review because it is the way that the weirdest of the weird can rise to the top and get support. Where are you going to go for money if you wish to do a sex change operation as your work? What if you want to collect 30,000 aluminum cans and put them in a giant globe and then stand in front of the Unisphere in Flushing Meadows Park and release them all over your head? in a piece called Kill Me or Change to protest our culture of waste? What if you want to burn money in front of the New York Stock Exchange? Um, so the artists, uh, I think it's important for the organization to be an artist-run organization because the artists don't shut other artists up. They let them go ahead and say whatever they damn well please. Whereas I think the job of those grants from the National Endowment for the Arts really were about figuring out a way to shut up the art, artist spaces, the artist-run spaces, how to professionalize them, which means um, we had to pick, we had to know what we were doing in two years hence, sometimes three years, sometimes four years. I mean. We don't know if we're going to be alive in four years. So uh, it was, it was, it's, it's, we're going back to the, the culture wars. Okay, so at the end of the culture wars, um, the board of directors on which Joseph Kosuth served uh, and Martha had a, a series of conversations about what the organization should be doing in relation to the culture at large. And we decided to go virtual. We decided to sell the loft in Tribeca, which was now worth something, and take the internet, uh, take our, our website as our public space and take the internet as the next free zone where artists could do whatever they damn well pleased. Okay. You know, it, the internet has limits too. And I had this idea when we went virtual that we would leave the body of the artist behind. No, that didn't happen either. And, I'm, and I regret, I regret going virtual in that the, the lure of real estate, the, the, we were we were a downtown hangout, a club for the avant-garde artist community, and we we left that we left that role. 
I regret that a little bit. On the other hand, the, the reach of the organization changed from 75 people sitting on hard folding chairs to literally millions of, millions of people around the world. So you have to kind of balance, balance the pluses and minuses. We went virtual, we moved to uh, lower Manhattan, even further lower down. 9-11 hit. We were a block and a half away from the World Trade Center. Uh, we got an RFP from the BAM Cultural District. They wanted to attract not-for-profit organizations to Brooklyn. I asked my board, should we move to Brooklyn? They said, all the artists moved to Brooklyn 10 years ago. We should absolutely move to Brooklyn. Uh, we're in Brooklyn today. And yesterday, no, two days ago, Friday the 5th, the organization moved to Pratt Institute. We have made the decision to nest at Pratt Institute. Why would we want to do that? The cultural influence that a small artist-run organization can have by embedding itself inside a larger educational edifice and inside of art history is very great. And uh, one, one of the things that's been one of the things that's been sitting on my shoulder for years and years is that Martha is Franklin Furness. Oh, this is Martha Wilson. She is Franklin Furness. If we are an artist-run organization and we have had cultural influence, but now we are embedded inside a larger educational institution, Martha could move to Brazil and Franklin Furness would be okay. Martha, thank you so very, very much. And uh, this idea of creating communities, which uh, uh, you've been doing in so many, many different ways, leads us right away to our next speaker, to Liu Ding, who as an artist and curator has been uh, developing uh, situations to create communities um, over a long time, very often in collaboration with another curator, with Carol Yinghua Lu, um, to whom we send greetings, who cannot be in Miami with us today, but um, is here by telepathy. Um, and uh, Liu Ding has particularly developed a project similarly to what Martha uh, was telling us about this idea of evolving over time, and Joseph as well, and, 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 and Rick Reed and Martha. In all the presentations, we have this idea of projects evolving in different chapters, and that's true very much for the Little Movements, which is a project Liu Ding has been doing with uh, Carol over the last couple of years, and it looks at self practices all over the world. It looks at self-organization, artist-run initiative, and in publishing, for example, Paul Chan's um, Badlands Press has to be mentioned in this context, of course. Um, Hito Steyl's initiatives, Eflux, uh, is another key example of an artist-run space, which connects very much to what Martha was said about the, uh, the digital. Um, or Hans Belting, who develops what he calls a thinking practice as an art historian, um, you know, in a way, an artist-run space through, through ideas. So please give a very, very warm welcome to Liu Ding. Thank you very much. Today I sit here with uh, my teachers to learn from them. I feel I need to learn. Uh, also, thank you, Ms. Guan. Uh, for my interpreter. Um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 their ideas, their experience, and their practice in the creator and the artist life. Um, 
before I came uh, participate in this panel, I really did not uh, really thought about how an artist can participate as a curator. Uh, I was sitting here and watching them share their work. I suddenly thought that the first one I did and the first one I did is my own work. When I sit in here, listen to four teachers talking about their experience, I saw my first exhibition. Uh, when I was 21, I decided I want to be an artist. I want to exhibit my paintings, so I host my own first exhibition. Uh, when I after I finish my exhibition, I realized that the exhibition can be a language. Uh, then I organized my friends' exhibitions. Uh, actually, in 2000, there was a very, very influenced me very much, a person who influenced me very much, who is also a curator, uh, a, a gallist. Uh, he is a, a gallery uh, gallerist in Holland. His name is Hans. He was in Beijing. He gave me a lot of encouragement. Uh, uh, when he learned I am interested in hosting the exhibitions, he gave me a lot of courage to working for that direction. Uh, when Organize the exhibitions for other artists that is also part of my self practice. Uh, in 2009, uh, I, decide, I decided to start my. Uh, I decided to start with my wife to do the exhibitions together. He, uh, she is also a curator. Uh, in 2008 to 2009, Chinese artist world is very active. Um, 同样在全球的艺术行业里边也是，在全球的艺术行业也是非常热闹。At that time, the global artist field is very active as well. 嗯，同样经济危机也开始了。At that time, the financial economic downturn started. 嗯，在中国这个时候也开始了美术馆的热潮，新建美术馆的热潮。at that time, China started building new museums. Um, in Chinese artist field, it pop up the ideas to think about the self practice. 其实在中国的艺术行业里，自我实践这个事情，从当代艺术开始之，从这个艺术开始有艺术家的时候就一直是伴随的，就一直是有的。Self practice it started a long, long time ago. It's with the artist's history. 
，嗯，但是这一次的自我实践呢，它其实夹杂了更多的，是对于机构的想象，对于这个权力的想象。This time, in 2009, in 2009, to, uh, 2008 to 2010, this time, in 2009, 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 in 2009,
嗯，接下来我们又做了另外一个展览，叫《偶然的信息》。The second exhibition we did is called the Accidental Message。这个展览我们从周围的艺术开始，回到了这个艺术史。We start from 周围的 the peripheral art back to the art history。呃，同样也讨论了我们是怎么介绍接受这些艺术史的信息。How to also discuss the how to accept the message from the art。包括是我们自身艺术史的信息和来自于欧洲和美国的信息。Including our own art history and the Western art history。呃，接下来这个展览以后，我们做了第三个展览。Then we did the third exhibition。呃，这个展览是发生在去年的。This is last year, 2013. 呃，这个展览我们完全回到了我们自己的艺术历史，在中国的艺术历史。This one we back to our own Chinese art history. 呃，这个展览的名字叫《艺术的问题到艺术的立场：社会主义现实主义的回响》。This is called from the issues of art to the issues of perception. Echoes of socialism, realism. 嗯，其实这个展览我们主要讨论的是从这个二三十年代开始，开始有社会主义、现实主义的这个有现实主义的艺术来到中国以后，它如何成为一个社会主义、现实主义 ？It's from twenty past century, twenties. To thirties, nineteen twenty to nineteen thirties. At that time, how the How the realism from China coming to China come to China become the socialism realism. 呃，同样，当形成了这个社会主义、现实主义以后，对这个当代艺术的影响是什么 ？Also, the in the influence to today's art from the socialist realism. 呃，因为其实当我们回重新讨论历史的时候，我们感觉到有一种紧迫。当我们自，无论是来自于啊，主要是来自于自己，在我们讨论艺术史的时候，总总是有一种预设。When we discuss the art history, we feel an urgency from ourselves. 首先讨论的是中国当代艺术是如何反抗的。First, we discuss the how Chinese art history to uh to Fight to fight with the culture. 嗯，但是在这样的一个鲜艳的前提下，我们如何讨论艺术？所以我们决定重新回到艺术的历史来看一看，怎么是什么情况形成了这样的逻辑 ？We back to the history to see how this become logic. 嗯。刚才我比较简单的介绍了一下我自己的工作的生涯，呃，因为我不不会说英语，所以也请大家原谅。I just uh briefly discussed and introduced my personal artist and curator life, because I don't know how to speak English. Hope that everybody can understand. 嗯，其实主要的问题是。在我的工作中发现很多的问题，我觉得有的时候是可以通过创作来完成的，有的时候我觉得需要是通过展览才能完成的。In my life, I feel that a lot of times the problem can be solved through my own artist expressions, but sometimes need the exhibition to express. 谢谢大家。Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Now, um, for logistical reasons, and um, uh, as there was uh, a late start of the panel, we cannot take questions. However, uh, what we can do is um, uh, that you have the speakers here, and I think you, know, uh, you can ask uh, if there are urgent questions individually, those questions to the speakers. Uh, many, many thanks to Ding, to Joseph, to Martha, to Martha, to Rick Reed for their extraordinary presentations, and thank you all for being here. Thanks a lot.